Thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak to you today. It's a great privilege. My name is Dr. Dylan Wilson. I'm a general paediatrician. What is a general paediatrician and what is my role? I see children of all ages, from newborns to those turning 18, with all presentations, all types of problems, and across all stages of development. <coughs> my role is to help children reach adulthood in the best possible state, having navigated the difficulties of any medical condition and those stages of development. One of those stages of development is puberty. It's important to remember what puberty is. Puberty is the normal stage of human development that allows us to progress to full sexual and reproductive maturity. That is the ability to have sex and reproduce should it be desired. It is a stage of human development that brings complex hormonal changes, physical changes to our bodies, our brains, our status in society and our social functioning. It is undoubtedly a challenging time for many humans, one that can cause distress but it is also an essential stage of human development that allows us to become the adults we are. But the, despite the importance of this stage of human development, the model of care for children distressed about their identity, what is known as the affirmation model for children, seeks to deliberately deny these children this essential stage of human development. This is done by giving children injections of particular drugs, colloquially known as puberty blockers, at the first opportunity the gender clinics have. The stage of pubertal development the gender clinics strive for is time of stage two. The stage of, pu stage of puberty named after British pediatrician James Tanner after his research work in the 1960s. There are five stages for males and females. Tanner stage one is prepubertal, that is all children for whom known changes have yet commenced. Tanner stage five is full adult maturity. It can be hard for non-medical people to conceptualize Tanner stage two, but it is possible. I'd like everyone in the room to take a moment to think back to their childhood and adolescence and try and recall when they first started showing signs of puberty. For the females in the room, this would be the first sign of budding breast tissue. For the males in the room, it was the first signs of pubic hair developing with some early slight growth of the penis and testes. Try to recall what age that was for you. For some in the room, it would have been while still at primary school. Some of you have been, would have been the average age in the early years of high school, and some of you would have been late developers. Try to recall the age you were when those changes first started happening. That is Tanner stage two. Now hold that image of your younger self in your head for the entirety of this evening. Now imagine that your body from that age had never matured past that point. This is the reality of blocking puberty at this stage. While there would be linear growth, there would be no other maturation of anything else. If you had received puberty blockers, there would be no further growth or maturation of your genitals. There would have been no growth of breast tissue. There would have been no maturation alongside your peers. When one stops to think about your own experience of puberty, these concepts are easier to conceptualize. What is less clear is what would be going on inside your body. The maturation of sperm occurs in the late stages of puberty. Similarly, while females are born with all the eggs they will produce for their lifetime if puberty is completed, they require the hormones of puberty to fully mature. Without progressing to the later stages of puberty, you would not be able to produce sperm or eggs. You would be sterile. Equally, while you're still recalling your younger self at that beginning stage of puberty, what was your concept of sex and sexual functioning like? <laughs> At the beginning of puberty, the idea of sex and sexual pleasure is only barely breaking. But without any progression, without any further growth of the genitals, or impact of sex hormones on the rest of your body and brain, there is no awakening. There is no progression of any libido, any sexual arousal, any desire for a sexual partner. Consider these two outcomes. I stated earlier that the aim of puberty is to reach sexual and reproductive maturation. The treatment pathway administered by gender clinics seeks to deny children from reaching sexual and reproductive maturation. These children reach adulthood without the ability to reach reproduce. They reach adulthood without the capacity to experience sexual pleasure. Fundamental components of human existence are being denied to these children. In addition to this, there are impacts on bone health. There are irreversible effects of testosterone on female bodies and estrogen on male bodies. We know that in all 
children who commence puberty blockers progress on to these hormones. Because of this progression, it is essential that when commenced on puberty blockers that the children and their parents fully understand, fully understand the consequences of these treatments. How is that possible? Consider your younger self again. Could you have understood the future sex life you were giving up? Or the chance to have a family of your own? It is not possible to consent children adequately for concepts they have yet to experience or require adult thinking to contemplate. Yet the gender clinics remove these life options from these children routinely in our children's hospitals. The word iatrogenic means harm caused by medical professionals. There is nothing physically wrong with the bodies of these children before they undertake this treatment pathway. But as a result of this treatment pathway, they receive iatrogenic harm. They are sterilized, rendered asexual or sexually dysfunctional, have their bone density affected, have the effects of cross-sex hormones for the rest of their lives, have their brains impacted to an unknown extent and will be medical patients for life. It is not possible to go through the puberty of the opposite sex. It is not possible for humans to change sex. It is incontrovertible that harms result from this pathway. Yet those proponents of this pathway do not openly acknowledge this harm. When iatrogenic harm occurs, it is essential to consider the reason the treatment was given in the first place and what the intended outcomes are. One should be absolutely sure that the benefits you claim will occur will outweigh the harms that will occur. Given the seriousness and severity of the harms that will occur, those advocating for this pathway need to demonstrate clearly what they are treating and what they propose to be the desired positive outcomes. What is being treated? The official diagnosis is gender dysphoria. What many do not realise is that the official diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria for pre-pubertal children relies on stereotypes. To receive a diagnosis, a child must meet six out of eight criteria. Five of the criteria are as follows. Number one, in boys, a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire or in girls, a strong preference for wearing only typical masculine clothing and a strong resistance to the wearing of typical feminine clothing. Number two, a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-believe play or fantasy play. Number three, a strong preference for toys, games or activity activities stereotypically used or engaged by the other sex. Number four, a strong preference for playmates of the other sex. Number five, a strong in boys, a strong rejection of typical masculine toys, games and activities, and strong avoidance of rough and tumble play. Or in girls, a strong rejection of typical feminine toys, games and activities. What if one does not believe that there is such a thing as boys toys, or girls toys, or clothes? What if one thinks it's perfectly natural for children to seek out friendships with other children regardless of their sex? What if it is a cross-gender role in make-believe play, and why is that abnormal? Even if taken together, they amount to the description of many, many children. Once again, I invite you to think back to your younger selves. How many females present had a strong resistance to the wearing of typical feminine clothing? How many males in the room avoided rough and tumble play? Rather than helping children in society challenge such stereotypes, the affirming clinicians use these stereotypes to confirm the child is trans. If the stereotypes are removed from the diagnosis, what is left? There is no doubt that there are children who are distressed about the sex they are and distressed about their bodies. But little consideration is given to the cause of that distress or any overlapping mental health issues. Instead, the stereotypes within the diagnostic criteria serve to highlight that the distress can only arise from a transgender identity. But without these stereotypes, what is being treated? The stereotypes present in the diagnostic criteria highlight the danger of social transition. Social transition is the act of treating a child as if they were the opposite sex, be that with clothes, hair, names or pronouns. But again, this is reliant on stereotypes. Is a girl who cuts her hair now a boy? Dr. Hilary Cass past president of the UK's Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in her interim report emphasises that social transition is not a mutual act. It facilitates the idea, based on stereotypes, that a child can be the opposite sex, that they are the opposite sex, and helps fulfil the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria, which
which leads them towards a pathway of medical treatment. This is what is known as a cascade of intervention. Yet around the world and in Australia, children are socially transitioned as a seemingly kind act. Instead of saying, you can be a girl who has short hair, we are saying, if you have short hair, you are now a boy. Schools in Australia partake in this process. But instead of a kind act, they are facilitating the idea that it's possible to change sex. And I remind you that this is not possible. It is not an act of kindness to promise children something that can never be realised. What are the desired outcomes from this medical treatment? As Gillian highlighted, the most strident arguments that you will hear is that this treatment is life-saving with regards to suicide. However, this is not supported by the evidence. There was no epidemic of gender-distressed children and adolescents committing suicide prior to the advent of this treatment pathway. There has, therefore, been no drop in suicide in children as a result of this pathway being given. Systematic reviews have taken place looking at mental health outcomes. A systematic review is when independent researchers take all the available research, analyze it in detail for biases, errors, and outcomes. The systematic reviews that have been conducted into puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for children conclude there is a very low certainty of benefit to mental health outcomes. If you contrast very low certainty of improvements to mental health, with the very high certainty of iatrogenic harm as I have outlined, why is this pathway still being administered? It is important to highlight that many of the children commenced on puberty blockers are not suicidal, but are commenced on treatment after being told it is the only way to prevent any possible suicidal ideation in the future. It is not uncommon to hear from the children themselves, if it wasn't for this treatment, I wouldn't be here today. When I hear this said, I believe that child has been failed. They have been led to believe that the only option for their mental health distress, or potential future mental health distress, is to pharmacologically adulterate their bodies, instead of the usual methods of therapy, support, and safeguarding that work so well for so many children. This is especially relevant given that we know, crucially, if supported in this manner, the vast majority of children's gender dysphoria will settle. The affirmative pathway does not give children this opportunity. It is evident that the aesthetic outcome is often prioritised. It is seen as desirable that a male appears more feminine as an adult by not going through male puberty. It is seen as desirable to prevent breast growth to allow females to appear more male. But at what cost? An aesthetically desirable outcome can only be achieved by inducing the atrogenic harm I have described. There are many trans adults who exist who have done nothing to their bodies. Changes in legislation have been made around Australia to remove the requirement for people to make changes to their bodies in order to meet legislative requirements but it's been, because it has been recognised that these medical changes bring a significant burden to the health of trans identified adults. It would do little to encourage children to seek out this adulthood where one can be trans without the negative consequences of medical treatments. This is not the only area of illogicality. If a 14-year-old Cameroonian girl is brought to the children's hospital suffering the physical consequences of breast ironing, a cultural practice that flattens the breast, it would trigger a notification to child protection services. But if a 14-year-old girl who identifies as male is brought into a children's hospital suffering the physical consequences of the breast binder, it could well be the children's hospital itself that supplied the binder. Both are cultural practices that flatten the breasts of girls to avoid womanhood. Why are they treated differently? It is often reported that very few children regret this treatment as adults. This is not true. We do not know if the number is very few, very many, or somewhere in between. The exact rates of regrets are not known because of the paucity of long-term follow-up data. No children's hospital in Australia has published any longitudinal data to date, despite despite promises it will be coming. Overseas cohorts, such as the original Dutch research cohort, suffered high dropout rates in their longitudinal follow-up attempts. The fewer than 1% regrets their treatment claim comes from those who underwent genital surgery who were able to be followed up and not lost to follow-up. We do not know how many females will regret their testosterone treatment or their mastectomy. We do not know what regret looks like in those who have been puberty blocked in Australia. The very best we can say is that we do not know the long-term outcomes. If we 
did not know how can children and their parents be sentenced. The only way that this is possible is if it is acknowledged, acknowledged that this is experimental. Experimental treatments should be supervised as part of experimental research trials. This is why, in the UK, it has been determined and recommended by Dr. Hilary Cass that puberty blockers only be commenced as part of a research trial. This is where the affirmation model is fundamentally flawed. The research trials are now following the assertion that this is standard medical care instead of preceding this assertion. To summarise, this pathway incontrovertibly leads to iatrogenic harm. This pathway has scant evidence that helps the mental health of children. It is an experimental treatment. This pathway requires children to be able to fully understand adult concepts such as their future sex life and family at a young age with the impact of cross-sex hormones on their bodies for years, a lifetime risk of associated iatrogenic disease, with little or no about potential to regret their treatment. As such, I do not believe these children and their families can adequately consent to this pathway. My view is not an extremist view. As I stated at the beginning, I'm a general paediatrician whose role it is to help children reach adulthood as healthy as possible. My view is that I think it is essential for children to go through puberty to be healthy adults, to grow, to mature, develop, have crushes, relationships, love, sex, all with a healthy body. My view is that mental health distress should be treated with mental health support. This is not an extremist view. It is a view shared by many concerned institutions around the world when this pathway is scrutinised. It is an extremist view to believe that the best way to deal with the mental health distress of children is to hormonally adulterate their bodies. It is an extremist view to consider that puberty can be avoided and the consequences don't matter. It is an extremist view to believe that it is possible for humans to change sex. It is therefore imperative that inquiries are undertaken to consider why these views form the basis of treatments being offered to our children in children's hospitals. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan said. Let an inquiry proceed to establish the veracity of these extraordinary claims. There is nothing to be lost by an inquiry. The scrutiny only needs to be placed on the medical professionals advocating for this treatment. There is no need to scrutinise children. Only medical professionals who fear scrutiny would object if they strongly believe in the pathway for which they advocate and commence, or would they have to fear. Thank you.